Greetings, and welcome to the latest edition of Today at Work, presented to you by the ADP Research Institute. Thanks to everyone for joining. My name is Christian Gomez, and I'm Vice President of Strategy within ADP's Global Enterprise Solutions. And it is, as, as usual, my pleasure to be able to bring you this quarterly broadcast of the latest Today at Work issue. Today, what we will be discussing is a variety of different topics that are going to be included in this uh, quarter's issue of Today at Work. And, and frankly, this is if not the, one of the best issues that we've had thus far. First, we're gonna hear from Liv Wang about the fact that people are working less, who and why. Then we're gonna hear from uh, Dr. Mary Hayes around the topic of employee engagement and the fact that it actually just hit a record high in 2023. She's also gonna to talk to us a little bit about stress at work and why it's not just about the job. And then Jeff, Nizaj is going to talk to us about the, how the law of supply and demand has failed our teachers. And then also at the end, we'll have a really fun part where you'll be able to try your hand at our new bracket. And then finally, uh, our chief economist and head of ADP Research Institute, Neela Richardson, is going to bring it all together for us uh, and then walk us into the Q&A where, where, where again, we'll answer all of your questions. For those of you that have joined us in the past and those of you that are joining us uh, for the first time, I'd just like to kind of set up the context of the Research Institute and the Today at Work initiative. And the fact that many of us, if not all of us, are very familiar with ADP, who happens to be one of the largest human capital management providers in the world, uh, what, what some of us may not understand is the fact that because of that breadth and scope of ADP's relationships, they have the largest data set of people at work in the world. And then ADP has an institute that dedicates itself to studying that data and then deriving insights that can inform all of us that are trying to create a better workplace. For the ADP, uh, I'm sorry, for the Today at Work issue, they utilize that extensive data set that is comprised of more than 25 million workers and over a decade of continuing surveys uh, that, that encompass over 550,000 workers in 29 countries. And then they utilize all that information to provide us the insights that we're going to hear today and that you'll find on our webpage and in each of the Today at Work issues that have been uh, deployed in the past. So without further ado, I'd love to dive into that first topic, which happens to be people are working less. Who and why? Liv, if you, uh, thank you for joining us. And we'd love to hear a little bit more about what you studied and what you learned. Hi, everyone. Today, I will introduce you some interesting findings we discovered about U.S. Employees Work Week. This study is based on ADP's real payroll data. We track hourly paid employees from non-farm private sectors. Every month, we observe around 30 million jobs. Over the last four years, while we've seen amazing job recovery, improved unemployment rate and a rising wages after the pandemic. The medium hourly work, our medium weekly hours worked has fallen, however. That medium hours from this huge sample fell almost 2% from 38.4 to 37.7 from December 2019 to December 2023. If we look at the job with less than 35 hours per week, the percentage of these part-time jobs are also rising. It went from 43% of part-time to 47% of part-time jobs among all the hourly jobs we are tracking. Why this is important? Because the hours not only determine total labor inputs to the economy, but also it affects personal income. In, additional to, in addition to the overall trend of shrinking work week, we identified who's driving the change the most as well. The left three columns in this table are showing the latest medium hours from the last two months uh, last three months from 2023. The next three columns are the changes in hours from the same months four years ago in 2019. Firstly, we see while men's medium work week stayed around 40 hours, 
women's hours decrease more than one per week. Men already worked longer, so this widened gender gap to 5.4 hours per week. Women account for less than half, half among all the jobs we observed, but there are 56% of women in the part-time jobs. Child care responsibility may be impacting the woman the most, especially since the pandemic. Secondly, we see it's the young adults driving the change. They have different responsibility from the older groups. Maybe there are less opportunities for entry level jobs, or maybe the gig economy offers more opportunities and the flexibilities. So one can spend less time on a single job. Move on to company size. Employees at small companies have typically put fewer hours each week than their counterparties at large companies. Maybe it's more flexible for the small company to adjust. Small companies are also more prone to the economic fluctuations. It is always easier to adjust hours before they change the headcounts. Head Among all these industries, workers from education, health, and the leisure and hospitality are working less. These will keep the in these industry short-staffed for a longer term. A burst of information industry hiring during the pandemic was followed by layoffs at large technology companies, leading to a 10% reduction in work week. Goods production industry like manufacturing and mining always experience long work week. So the regulations and the labor cost for overtime may affect employers' decision on the hours can be offered to, the, to their employees. Lastly, we have some findings to link the hours and income. We matched employees who has worked more than 12 months for the same job to track their year over year change of the total annual pay, total annual hours worked, and average wage during the years. The left chart showing us that among all the people working less than a year before, the percentage of people are earning more wage is more than 80% most of the time. That's the blue line. The orange line is showing us the percentage who work less but still making more annually. So during most of the time in 2022, more than 40% of people are working less than a year ago but still making more. Move on to the second chart. We divided people by their annual income level. The first quartile, the low, weight, low income people, they are always working more than a year ago. But the growth rate has slowed down after the wage peaked during the middle of 2021. But the latest trend showing the fourth quartile, the highest earners, they put less work week than before. So the rising wage combined, the rising wage helped to offset the hours reduction cost to wage reduction. There are many reasons can cause the changing hours. It can be both coming from employer side and employee side. So we send out some poll questions to ask you to ask about your ob uh, observations. We can discuss about the result later. That's all from my findings. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Liv. It's so always phenomenal to hear directly from you and those that actually do the research. And 
And this topic particularly is a very interesting one because traditionally, if those of us that follow the labor market, it's, we're all usually talking about job creation and we're talking about unemployment. But this is actually really interesting in terms of what type of work are people actually doing and how has that changed? We all know that the pandemic has dramatically changed the way that all of us work and the way that our organizations set themselves up for us to be able to, to, to make a living. Uh, and, and this is just an area that we're first starting to get a better understanding of as, as it is fast developing. And as you mentioned, uh, a better way, a, a, an even more effective way for us to be able to learn more about this topic is by engaging with you, our community. So. We wanted to start the first poll by asking you, in your experience, within your own organization, are your employees working fewer hours than before the pandemic? And I'll just remind everyone, uh, for those of you that are looking to get credit, please be sure to respond to the survey so that you can get your, uh, your, your CPE credit. I'll give you guys a couple of seconds, answer the question, and then I'll, I'll show with you the answer of, in terms of what everybody's seeing and feeling. And... Here are our results. Interesting. So the majority of us, well, actually, I would say if you if you average it out, we're almost split or, or, uh, down the middle. Some of us are, are saying that it's the same, and then there's some of us that are going few hours and some of us more hours. Very interesting. And, and uh, based off of what I'm seeing in the chat, I agree 100%. A lot of this is going to vary based off of the industry. But we have another question for you. Who do you believe or who is making in your actual organization the decisions on hours worked? Is it the employee, the organization, or are you unsure? I'll give you some time to answer this one as well. I'm going to close it here. We have a matching data set, which I know our researchers love. Who is making the decisions on hours worked? Uh, 28, almost 29% of you said the employee. A little bit over 60% believe it's the company. And a little bit under 11% are just not sure. So again, fascinating insight, a topic that I invite all of you to explore further inside of the report itself. Uh, they post it in the chat where you can find it and I'll do so at the end of the presentation as well. But I'll move on to the next present segment of the presentation that'll be introduced by Dr. Mary Hayes. And these are two topics that I know are incredibly important and there's a lot of interest out there. So thank you so much, Dr. Mary Hayes, again for joining us. Thank you, Christian, for the introduction. Today, I'm here to talk about global engagement and global stress. We define engagement as the emotional state of mind that causes people to do their best work sustainably. Over the last decade, we've been tracking engagement globally to determine the number of workers who are all in. Using the data from engage, our eight engagement pulse items, uh, workers are separated into two groups, coming to work and fully engaged. Let's look at the findings. In 2005, we began our global journey with engagement with 13 countries. The number of countries grows each time we have surveyed workers. And in 2023, we examined worker sentiment in 28 countries. Looking at the graph, what do we see? Engagement has dipped, of course, during the pandemic as many workers lost their jobs and the ones who remained on the job had to pick up the slack and possibly work more um, than their own jobs. Engagement has been on the rise um, since then, with, with 2023 being the highest record engagement to date. Um, two of the biggest differences in engagement from our research are hybrid work and teamwork. So let's dig into that. So where are people working? There's been a shift over the last year with workers leaving remote work to return to the office. Reporting of remote work is down 4% year over year and hybrid work lost 2% as well to the on-site office workers. Looking specifically at engagement by work location, hybrid wins that battle. The highest percentage of workers who are fully engaged is 23%, 5% higher than the global average. The lowest percent of workers who are fully engaged is in the remote only group. We don't have all the answers as to why this is the, is the case. If an organization has a large 
workforce who are remote only, it might be beneficial to think about how to check in with them more frequently and see how they're faring. What we do know is that the power of hybrid work, hybrid workers are 1.9 time, times more likely to be fully engaged than remote workers. Team membership, right? Another large difference occurs when we examine the power of teams. About 93% of all employees surveyed globally are at least part of one team. Looking across those who are on teams versus no teams, engagement differs widely, right? When we look at work on teams, they're much more likely to be fully engaged than those who are not on teams. When we look at where people work, team membership and engagement, the largest differences occur in both the on-site and hybrid work environments. Let's look at that. For office workers, those on teams are three times more likely to be fully engaged than those not on teams. We have information about global engagement coming to the data lab on the ADPRI website in the next few weeks. So you can dig in further into this edu uh, engagement journey. The second topic I wanna talk about today is stress. Give you a second to digest all this stuff on this slide. We began experimenting with a two construct approach to stress in 2022. Through the research, we learned that stress is complicated and <laughs> complex. Our six question measure looks at good stress, you stress, and bad stress, distress, to unravel the workplace stress. From these six questions, we are at, able to classify workers into three groups, thriving workers, rattled workers, and overloaded workers. With our 2,800 sample who, of workers surveyed across the globe, we are able to classify these workers into three categories. This is what we found. The distribution of stress, 29% of all workers are thriving, 17% are overloaded, and 54% are somewhere in between in the group we call rattled. Similar to engagement, we conducted our research to determine if there were different conditions where workers were thriving more than they were overloaded. The first question, the first condition is the ability to love what you are doing. So as we look at this slide, the graph shows those who love their work are much more likely to land in the thriving category. And on the other hand, without love, there is much more opportunity to be overloaded than thriving. Work location matters to stress as well. Let's look at that. So home can be an escape. Those in the hybrid work and arrangements are much more likely to be in the thriving category than in the overloaded category. There are also differences in the remote and on-site groups, but the change, the difference is not as drastic as the hybrid. And of course, the biggest question that the ADB Research Institute people and performance researchers look at is why do we care about stress? Right? It's plain and simple. Higher negative stress and a lack of love leads workers to the exits. Let's look at the next slide. So we looked at those who were overloaded and if they loved or didn't love their work. The top bar on the graph are those who are overloaded and do not love their work. 83% of these workers are actively looking for employment outside of their current organization. The bottom bar on this graph is workers who love their work and are balancing stress in, fav in their favor and are thriving. 
two thirds of these workers have no intent to leave their organization. So helping workers find work that they love and to achieve a balance between use stress and distress will help organizations retain more of their workers in the end. Stay tuned again for more information about stress globally in the data, work, data lab next week. Back to you, Christian. Thank you so much, Mary. Such important topics. And again, a little bit of good news. It's always good to, 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 to see sometimes as we're analyzing what's happening in the labor market to see positive trends. And I know as we all went through the pandemic, especially everybody that's been dedicated to this profession, we've all seen a greater focus on employees and the experience. How do they, how they feel ends up having a material impact on what they do when they show up to work. And hopefully, my hope at least, we, the, the research doesn't point to that just yet because it's just coming out, but hopefully that extra effort, that extra energy and appreciation that organizations are placing on their employee, on their employee experiences are starting to pay off. And as it relates to stress, I, again, very fascinating insight there, uh, helping us better understand ourselves and each other so that we can best uh, set ourselves up and the people that we serve for a better working experience. Uh, the next topic that I'd like to tee up would be for uh, our good friend, Jeff Nasaj, and he is going to talk to us about, a. Uh, first of all, we're gonna start with a very interesting topic that I, uh, I know I think is gonna create a lot of discussion. And that is the fact that the law of supply and demand has failed our teachers. Jeff, uh, are you out there? Hey, sir. I'm here. Thank you, Christian. Good to see you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'll be talking about the teacher supply and demand um, trends that we've been seeing in our data. So the U.S. has struggled with a teacher shortage, a problem that has only gotten worse uh, when the pandemic started. So the ADP Research Institute build indices to track trends in employment and wages for both public and private teachers K through 12. Here we'll take a brief look at the supply and demand trends for teachers. On this first chart, uh, we see the job openings for education industry based on BLS job openings data indicated by the red series, while the blue series shows employment of teachers, both indexed to January, 2018. We can see that the job openings for educators have increased dramatically since 2001, 2021, when the pandemic hit. And while the employment levels indicated by the blue series have remained relatively flat. So this clearly shows that demand for teachers has outstripped supply. So in economics, this should be an imbalance that should lead to higher wages as of the law of supply and demand dictates, but Instead, teacher pay has lagged. So we can see what, so what this chart is showing um, is basically what we call the competitive salary index. And the competitive salary index is the ratio of teacher salary to all US workers. So if the teacher's salary was on par with all US workers, this trend would follow the red baseline chart, right? But clearly that's not the case. Instead, you can see here, there is a growing gap between teacher pay compared to all US workers. Now there's two caveats that we need to keep in mind here. When we did this analysis, uh, in this comparison, we, we did not control for the differences in level of education between teachers and US workers. And, and the second thing is that we also didn't control for the number of hours work. So the differences in hours work between teachers and US workers, as you know, teachers uh, hours could, could vary throughout the, the school year. But I think ba based on this trend, we can all agree that the trend, that the pay for teachers is definitely lagging. Go on to the next slide. So we further looked at this competitive salary index based on different age groups. And we compared the teacher's salary to US employees for their respective age groups. So we can see what we can see in this chart um, by the brown line at the top, and then the yellow line, the yellow chart uh, line below that. Um, you can see that the, the salaries for for the younger teachers have really eroded. So for for the young teachers, the competitive salary index dropped from 140 percent in 2018 to now 115 percent. 
And then for teachers, 25 to 30, it's dropped from 115 to 100%. Now we all know that teachers do not enter the profession for the money, but lagging pay compared to US workers will make it difficult to attract and retain young teachers. And you can see for the other age groups, the relative uh, salaries have somewhat maintained a little bit better over time compared to US workers. So what we can summarize is that the overall labor market has made it hard to recruit and retain teachers since the pandemic. So what can be done to attract and retain more teachers into the workforce? Education employers will need to provide greater incentives to attract and keep teachers on board. So if higher salaries are not an option, then some non-monetary benefits like professional training and flexible work arrangements might be some other options to stem the shortage of teachers. And that's, that's my presentation on teachers. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, such an important topic, and I really appreciate, obviously, the spotlight that you've put on, on this issue. Uh, I venture to say that the majority of the people that are attending this webinar are, might not be in the education space, but this is something that impacts all of us as a society. I think it's a non-controversial thing to say that the role that teachers play in our society is incredibly important. Uh, they, they craft the education of the future that is going to guide us to hopefully be able to pass on uh, skills, experience, and ability to thrive in the next generation. So even though th there's, we might feel like there's very little that we can actually do to be able to have a direct impact on this, number one, just creating awareness and being very vocal about the fact that this is a profession that deserves our attention, deserves our appreciation. Secondly, there are certain things that we can also do to make sure that we support the education space and, and our teachers. First and foremost, take your experience and your education and volunteer it. Take time off of work, go and work in your schools, be active, especially if you're a parent in a particular school, and help augment that. Donate to teacher uh, organizations that help supplement some of the things that they need and, 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 and some of the awareness that can be created around their importance. But more importantly, let's just keep a close eye on this as we're thinking about how important they are in our society and what we could potentially do. Now, before we kind of transition into the last topic, I want to remind everyone that there will be a Q&A section right at the end, so there is still time to submit your questions for us to be able to address them. And without further ado, right in time for March Madness, Jeff, you have a new bracket for us uh, that I think will be very interesting to everybody that's in attendance. Yep. Yep. So now we'll transition from uh, Department of Education to the Department of Fun and Games. So our business card bracket. So we've analyzed uh, 17.6 million workers in the ADP sample and identified the 16 most frequently occurring job titles. And as you said, Christian, just in time for March Madness, we've placed these job titles in a tournament bracket based on their ranking in the analysis. So these are the top 16 job titles that occurred most frequently in 2023. And our question is, can you guess which, top, which job title takes the top spot? So at this point, um, I will need some assistance maybe from Christian to help run. Yeah, absolutely. So let, let's bring the poll back. So remember our CPE credit takers, uh, we need you to participate in order to get your, your, your credit. Everybody else, we'd love to hear from you. What do you believe was the most used job title in 2023? And I'll keep all, you all in suspense for some seconds while we get everybody to answer. Based off of our audience, customer, let me scroll down. Yep, customer service representative at 30.3% is the, the, the number one guess. Let me see, just to confirm who came in second. Account manager, followed by executive assistant, were second and third. So what was the most used job title in 2023? And here we go. <laughs> we have a very wise audience that obviously has a pulse on the on the labor market. Yes, customer service representative was the most used job title in 2023. Thank you all for participating in the poll. We had phenomenal participation. And again, congratulations to all of you that had the right answer. Now, uh, 
I've been looking forward to this part of the presentation where I get to invite our close friend and chief economist of ADP, who is also the head of the Research Institute and leads this amazing uh, body of work and all these amazing researchers, Dr. Neela Richardson. Thank you for joining us today. That never gets old, does it? <laughs> Thank you, Christian, for the kind introduction. I wanted to send my belated uh, welcome to all of you who joined us from all around the country. I, I saw so many different places and spaces, and I, I thank you for engaging us. I also want to thank Liv, Mary, and Jeff for bringing this research to light. I, I think it confirms for me what's going on in the labor market. I'm an economist by training. Um, you all are have your, your pulse on what's happening in your organizations. But bringing our worlds together, it shows that there's a lot going on under the hood of the labor market. When we look at the macro numbers, we see that we have a labor market that's chugging along every month. It is producing really, really solid job gains. We see wages are growing before the pandemic, but the pandemic has left an imprint on this market. Well, the, the headline numbers look strong and solid. There's a lot going on. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about hours work, hour less in 2023 than um, they did in 2019. Finds in our cover story for today at work. And there could be a lot of reasons for that. There might be uh, more interest in flexibility, uh, having uh, alternative work arrangements, or it could be a decision uh, by companies in order to maybe avoid overtime or make sure that they have more workers in case workers call in sick or, or leave the uh, uh, decide like they did during the great resignation to switch in droves to other jobs. So this could be a way that companies are building resilience in their health headcount. We actually don't know. All we see is the medium wage just happening. So to us, that is a mystery that we're going to keep looking into. Um, when we think about Mary's work, on engagement and uh, stress. These two things, I think, are naturally fit together. I would, I'm not a, a, a nearly as deep in this work as Mary is. Engagement and stress being leaked through teams. We find that people um, who are on teams tend to have more engagement and, and I think as a result, have less stress. Um, some of the professions that we see that are uh, losing people, like teaching, as Jeff points out, uh, and they're not, not only suffering from weakening wages and worker, but they tend not to work in teams. And so that support system of engagement may not be there if you're, my mom's a teacher, if you're solo in a classroom most side of your team framework. So all of these factors actually kind of weave together to, to show a very complex picture of, of, the, of the world of work. When all, some of us are working remotely, some of us are hybrid, some of us every day. Sometimes I come to the office every day and I'm on WebEx most of the day because my colleagues are remote. This is a new way of working for all of us. And so it's challenging for uh, companies to both facilitate engagement and to support uh, de-stress, or at least good stress in the workplace that motivates. So when we put all this together, um, this is a time of change for the workplace, for the worker, for the company. And I think the what we can provide at the ADP Research Institute is offering a space to talk about all the changes that are happening across our industries uh, around the world and here right here in the U.S. So with that, Kristen, I'd like to turn it back to you for some engagement, some questions, Q&A with the rest of the team and see what, what you're hearing and feeling uh, in your organizations and perhaps what the data is showing about how all of this fits together. Absolutely. Thank you again so much, Neela, to you and the team for all of the amazing work. And we have phenomenal engagement in the Q&A section, so we have some really good ones lined up. Excellent. And I thought I would start Thanks. off <laughs> by throwing uh, a softball for Dr. Mary Hayes, because I know that you're very eloquent on the topic and it's coming from Susan. And it's how did your survey or your methodology attempt to assess 
engagement levels for employees. And I think part of that question could also, if you could in your answer, Dr. Mary Hayes, uh, tell us a little bit about full engagement and why that is the metric that you're using in so many of, of, of your charts and the way that you're describing the phenomenon. Sure, Christian. Um, so the way that we measure engagement comes from eight items. And you can find those eight items on our website on adpri.org. We have a paper called the Definitive Series of on Enga Employee Engagement. Um, so those eight items, we've looked at those over um, many years, and they are all levers for um, a team leader to push or pull to help organizations, help their teams be more engaged. Um, we separate those eight items using a proprietary algorithm into fully engaged and coming to work. Now, coming to work is just that, right? It is, I'm not giving extra, I'm not giving less, I'm just coming to work, doing my job, going home. When we see those individuals at the top of those eight items, they are all in. They're ready to give more and more and more to their organization. And so that's, those eight items are what we have used for over a decade to understand engagement. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I have another uh, question that came in from Dr. Solange Shara, and this one uh, will be directed to Jeff. And the question is, the assumption for the data or for the report that you shared is that you're analyzing K through 12 or uh, non-higher education. Given the fact that demographics show that the population of, 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 of individuals below the age of 18 is flat, does this mean that they have, that there is less demand for teachers as there should theoretically be fewer classes? Or how do you explain the growth in, in teacher positions at large? Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, currently, there are a lot of um, schools that are operating under conditions where there's an existing shortage. So just based on that, um, you know, they're, they're facing an uphill challenge. Um, and then most likely also there's, uh, there's also, you know, the teachers that specialize in uh, different different uh, different fields for helping children so I you know when I was a when I was a student you know, we only had one teacher and now there's you know multiple teachers that help the students through different various aspects of their education um, whether it's you know a specialized field of uh, you know, their speech or you know that kind of thing so I think specialization might might be another um, another aspect to it Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, the next question that I'm, that I'm going to uh, put out is from Monica. And the question is, is the decrease in employees working from home, do we believe that it's due to the company, uh, to company policies, or is this individual choices? I thought, Neela, I, I, know, I know that spans across several studies. I thought I'd, I'd tee up that question over to you. And the question is, is the decrease in people working from home a company question? Or I think a lot of companies have called workers back to work. I think that's what we saw in 2023. Uh, we are headquartered at ADP in, in uh, New Jersey, and we sit outside Wall Street. And a lot of the big banks said, hey, look, if you're going to make a New York City salary, you need a New York City location. And then that's in our offices. So I think that was part of it. Um, but there has been some pushback. Uh, workers have understood that, you know, both sides of their, their lives need to be honored by their place of employment. So whether they're in the office or outside of the office, hybrid work seems to provide a, a good balance. And that is reflected in Mary's work. Yeah, she finds that hybrid workers tend to be more engaged in what they do. So there is this middle ground, I think, employers were, can can offer. The last point I'll make on this, and I, I apologize if my sound is kind of, I, I see that in the chat for some of you, but I was just talking to Jay Caldwell, who is chief talent officer at ADP, and he, you know, his job is to recruit talent. 
talent for a very large company. And now uh, it's not just about compensation. That used to be the first line of negotiation between worker and employer or candidate and employer. Now it's about compensation compensation and compensation and flexibility and work from home and all of these other benefits and attributes that employees are offering. As Jay uh, <laughs> references it, workers want more of more. <laughs> so more compensation, more flexibility. So how do you, you know, meet business needs and meet the worker where they are? Um, that's the challenge of, of uh, companies today. Thank you so much, Neela. That, that I appreciate and I definitely agree with that perspective in terms of what you're seeing and hearing. Um, I have a question from Olivia uh, that I will actually uh, direct to Liv, which is, do you see a trend of the shorter work week, especially or more magnified in the areas of tech and information? Uh, in the working less section, this, down, uh, uh, this downward trend was attributed to layoffs in tech companies is the entirety of her question. Liv? Yeah, we do see a shorter work week for tech. And also, uh, actually, information has experienced one of the biggest decline in the work week among all the industry. It's almost 10% reduction from our findings. We mentioned the layoffs because the employment data alone cannot reflect this quiet cutting. So together with a shorter work week, showing a slowdown in that industry after the bust we seen during the pandemic. So a lot of employers from information, they were hoarding the employees during the pandemic period. Right now, not only there's um, layoffs, but also the reduced work week is very obvious. It's a very obvious trend for this industry. Thank you so much, Liv. Um, I, have a, I have another question. This one I'll, I'll direct to Dr. Mary Hayes, and it's coming from Rick. Uh, in, your, in your studies about stress, for those that are overloaded, have you studied a connection or the impact that, that overloaded workers have had on items such as mental health or just health in general? Or, or is that something that, that, that we, we are looking to study in the future? Yeah, Christian, um, mental health is, is a huge concern um, when individuals become overloaded and stressed. We have not specifically looked at, um, I did see talked about suicide rates. Um, we are at the Institute, we're not mental health professionals. And so we try not to go into um, areas where it, it deals with those sensitive topics. So we tend to look at the, the impact of stress on work um, and not necessarily mental health. Thank you, thank you so much. Now, the let me see, I think we have a couple of more that we can draw from. I have one for Liv around the study on work week trend. What do you what does this data about the work week trend mean for employers and for HR? How should individuals that are either running organizations or specifically setting up their HR departments, how should they be looking at this data that, we're, that, that you're presenting to us? So this data, similar to all of the research that's part of quarterly today at work, introduces new insights for employers to think about and then make data-driven decisions. Some benchmarks also help them to evaluate where they stand and where they should go. Sp speaking more of this work week data, the trend could, si could signal a psychological shift in the way we work. Employees now desire more flexibility, work-life balance, and desire to, the desire to, work, uh, to choose where, when, and how they work. For the employers, this data signals if they want to continue recruiting and retaining top talent, offering flexibility needs to be top of mind. It is important to be aware that who has the ability to work less and who demand more flexibility. 
Thank you so much, Liv. What a phenomenal way to wrap up such a great session. Um, I Once again, I want to invite all of you to download the full report. It is amazing work uh, that goes into more detail on some of the topics that you heard here today. Uh, you can scan the QR code or you can go to www.adpri.org. Uh, don't just download the report. I encourage you to subscribe and follow the ADPRI team so that you don't miss any of the research that they're putting out there. And again, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to attend this session, to share in the insights that are being provided by the Institute and these amer amazing researchers. And again, thank you for all the work that you do to help us collectively build a better, healthier a world of work. Thank you so much. Cheers.